Uh, I'm Dan Notterman, uh, and uh, I'm a professor of pediatrics in the Cancer Institute of New Jersey at Robert Wood Johnson. Uh, I think that I was probably asked uh, to switch from my moderator position at the second uh, session to this position uh, by Arnie because he noticed I didn't have a tie on today. It's the first time he's ever seen me without a tie. And he liked the David Letterman look and so asked me to, <laughs> to join these scholars here. So uh, let me uh, introduce uh, uh, my two colleagues uh, on stage today. To the right is uh, Paul Stephen Miller. Uh, Professor Miller is the Henry M. Jackson Professor of Law at the University of Washington School of Law. Uh, he attained his uh, BS at uh, the University of Pennsylvania, his law degree at Harvard. Uh, his um, early work was at the Western Law Center for Disability Rights at Loyola and then uh, joined the Clinton-Gore transition team uh, in 1992. He continued his work at the White House as the Deputy Director of the U.S. Office of Consumer Affairs, and from 1994 to 2004 was Commissioner of the United States Equal, Opportunity, Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, and there he played a major role in crafting early genetic privacy legislation. He now focuses his scholarship and teaching in the areas of disability law, genetics, and the law and re genetics in the law and related areas. To my left is my uh, good friend and my former and future colleague at Princeton, uh, Professor Lee Silver, who's professor of molecular biology and public affairs at Princeton University, also attaining his bachelor's degree at the University of Pennsylvania, PhD at Harvard in biophysics, a postdoc at Sloan Kettering. Uh, after uh, some peregrinations around the East Coast, he landed at Princeton in 1984, where uh, for many years he was uh, solely in the Department of Molecular Biology, uh, in uh, working in vertebrate genetic models, and later migrated uh, over to the Woodrow Wilson School, where he is a uh, professor of public and international affairs. He's a well-known authority in biomedical ethics, having edited or published, published the six books, in addition to his voluminous uh, other publications. And most recent, uh, his most recent uh, is Challenging Nature, The Clash of Science and Spirituality in the New Frontiers of Life, which I believe was published in 2006, just last year, Lee. April book. Yeah, next, next month. Good, good. I won't put a plug in. For okay. Uh, but there will be a signing uh, afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> so we, um, we learned a terrific amount uh, today. Um, it was really a terrific uh, morning and afternoon. Uh, we learned uh, about the genetic polymorphisms that affect cancer susceptibility. Uh, we learned about mutations uh, that affect cancer susceptibility and risk of cancer. We learned how this risk flows through families, how it affects people. Uh, we learned uh, how it may be possible to stratify and adjudicate risk based on a molecular nosology of cancer, perhaps someday replacing the older, uh, less precise pathological uh, method of uh, classifying cancer. Uh, we learned uh, that it might be possible to prevent cancer in individuals, and then we learned this afternoon that it might be possible to prevent cancer in our posterity, in the progeny, in the progeny of people who are affected with these mutations, uh, perhaps, and these polymorphisms. So we've learned a tremendous amount of what we can do. We've learned what is possible, and the purpose of today's uh, discussion is to begin to think about what we ought to do. How should we apply this knowledge in the service of humankind and do it in a way which is both ethically forceful uh, and effective? And so I will turn to uh, my two colleagues. I guess I'll turn to Dr. Silver first, if that's all right, and ask him how we should apply this knowledge. Um, I think before we can answer that question, we have to define our terms. That seems, sounds like a very simple sentence. How should we apply this knowledge? But we is actually a complicated word. And uh, the, the question I think that came up several times today is who should be choosing the, the choices that are going to be made? When you talk about something like um, risk benefit analysis or cost benefit analysis, um, it, that sounds like a simple mathematical concept that you should be able to calculate, but it depends on whether you're talking about risk benefit to individuals or to the population as a whole. As we know, vaccines, I mean, the, the, the whole strategy of, of uh, childhood vaccines is, is a population strategy. We're talking about benefits to a population 
where in fact some individual liberty um, is, is taken away so that a population can benefit. But very often we're talking about, I think, uh, risk uh, benefit ratios that concern individuals. And um, the question there is who should be making the choices? Who should decide what, uh, what this ratio really is? Should it be an individual or should it be the doctor or, or should it be uh, Leon Cass and the President's Bioethics Commission? So, um, and different people have different views about that. I, I was, uh, I should just bring this up now because I was just listening this morning when um, there was this discussion about whether individuals should be allowed to see their own genetic information. Uh, and I just have to say that I found it very paternalistic to have this notion that somebody else can tell a competent adult whether or not they should be able to see their genetic information. Um, so that's, that's, I think we can start the conversation. Good, let, me, let me bring Professor Miller in then. How, how does the law contribute to adjudicating, if you will, the question of who decides and what the calibration is between society's interest in deciding and the individual perception of liberty? Well, I think that there's an old, and I'll, I don't know if it's a Chinese proverb, but we were talking about Chinese proverbs earlier, but I'll assume it's a Yiddish proverb. Where, <laughs> it probably is. Probably right. is that too. But, uh, where you stand depends upon where you sit. And so I think that in, in some ways that's part of the lens by, by, by which we, we need to really think about these issues. I think that the law, quite frankly, hasn't caught up with the science. Science is really um, changing rapidly. Social mores are being created and formed. And so, quite frankly, we don't really know where we are as a society, how we feel about these, um, all of these issues that, that we're talking about. I, I think that there are a couple of different um, things that I want to put on on the table, and and um, Lee sort of mentioned. Well, of course, we want to give competent adults the um, the decision making authority. It would be paternalistic to not do so, and I think generally that's about right. But I think that begs the question of sort of what is sort of what is competency when you're talking about sort of. Um, folks who are not well versed in the science when you're talking about a patient at a very, very uh, distressing uh, time in their life being told about risks of 10%, risks of 17%. It's very, very difficult, I think, for, um, for patients to sort of know what to do with that information. And I think it's also important to recognize that healthcare professionals, whether they're the physician or the genetics counselor or what have you, also have a tremendous amount of power and authority because people are really looking for the right answer when in fact there may, may not be the right answer. When you fold kids into the equation, whether they're kids who were born or kids who were not quite yet born, um, it becomes even more complex because there you have um, a, a parent acting out of very, very sincere, earnest, protective needs, making decisions on behalf of somebody else with, again, sort of imperfect amounts of, of information and really seeking to understand that. And, that's, and I think that's one of the real core issues here is understanding what to do with risk when it's cloaked in the language of science. So I, I, I think uh, one of the things that I'd like to, to respond to is that I think it's different for an authority figure to encourage or discourage a particular uh, behavior or, or a particular uh, line of treatment from requiring it. And I, I, the best example I can think of is tobacco smoking. I mean, everybody in America knows that smoking tobacco is going to increase cancer rates, I think it's probably the number one cause of avoidable cancer in the world. Uh, we don't make tobacco smoking illegal for adults. We tried that with alcohol, right, didn't work. So we don't make it illegal for adults, but we have a, 
very sophisticated campaign to say you're really stupid if you smoke. You're going to become addicted and high, increase your risk of cancer. Um, with a lot of these, um, uh, well, a lot of this genetic information, very sophisticated, you can have a physician say to an individual, this is my opinion, um, but you can maintain the, the, the person's liberty by allowing the person to make a decision, if the, if the decision only affects that person uh, and their family, not society as a whole. I would argue that in the end, it has to be the individual who makes the decision, even if it's a bad decision. I, I agree. I mean, in, in, in most instances, the way I see it is you've really got two potential decision makers, either the individual or the government. The government through regulation, thou shalt not. And given the choice of the individual or the government, I tend to feel more comfortable with letting individuals make, with making those kinds of decisions. And yet, I think it becomes very, very um, um, difficult for parents, particularly in the reproductive uh, uh, setting. We heard about PGD and, and, and pre um, implantation genetic um, diagnoses and so on. And, and I think that, I mean, one of, the, one of the, the sort of issues around genetics is this really occurs on this continuum. And so one of the things we do in law, of course, is we like to sort of figure out where you draw the line. And so to the extent that you've got sort of uh, Tay-Sachs or something that's sort of really tragic in the sense that it results in death, well, that's okay. Um, we, we, we've sort of reached a societal consensus around that. We've heard a bunch of different conversations around cancer, and we're here around cancer. And, and the way that I think about it is that in thinking about genetics and genetic prevention through sort of using these reproductive technologies, one thing that's important to keep in mind is that we're really, for the most part, talking about adult onset disease or later onset, onset disease, and that there are all sorts of different variables. And so when a physician and a parent is sitting there talking about their child about some cancer that may happen when they're 30, 35, 40. They're just thinking about this baby and how they want to protect this baby. And yet, in some ways, we might be overprotective because, in a sense, somebody who lives to the age of 40 before they, before they get cancer, many people would say that's a pretty good life. Well, before we, I, I'd like to discuss this because my opinions are a bit different than yours there, but I think before we go from adulthood all the way down to embryos, <laughs> we should um, stop at childrenhood. <laughs> okay. Um, and there's a presumption in this country, in most countries, that um, parents have a right to make decisions for, for their children. And that's a legal standard, by yes, the way. Yes, yeah. yes. Uh, and uh, parents have to go pretty far it has to be really clear that what they're doing is harming their child before a court will step in, like Christian scientists who refuse to give their child a cancer treatment, for example. Then, you know, the court will step in and say, no, the, we're acting on behalf of the child. But I mean, ch parents do all sorts of things. I mean, some of my best friends do things that I think are, well, pushing their children, you know, into, into all sorts of uh, activities to increase their chance of getting into Princeton or, or Harvard. Um, and none of you in the audience or are like of course. All right. <laughs> or um, Yale. <laughs> <laughs> now you or I, of course, we're, we're more sensible. We, we don't like that. But I don't think we would stop, in this country, we don't stop parents from going pretty far in terms of how they decide they want to raise their children. Um, now, um, I think we can go back to the embryos stage and say, okay, you know, this, the, this couple can produce a bunch of embryos in, in, in a neat in vitro fertilization clinic. Um, and if nobody did anything, one of those embryos would have randomly gone forth and developed, if they were lucky and they wanted a child, uh, into a baby. And so the question is, under what circumstances should you say to a couple, well, you can, you know, here's a bunch of embryos, here are some genetic differences, uh, this particular genetic difference, well, you can select embryos that have this gene or don't have this gene, but for this other gene, we're not going to let you select. 
Now, a physician can just refuse to do it, of course. Right. But um, you know, do can we say to all of society, you cannot choose this particular gene, whatever it is, I'll give you a straight nose. You can't choose the straight nose gene over the appropriate nose gene. Let me or ask gender, a question. <laughs> for that matter. Right. <laughs> Now you finally provoked me. So, so, so let me ask you a I question. I was trying I know hard. you were. The pointy <laughs> stick. <laughs> so uh, as a pediatrician, um, uh, I actually agree um, that the government has very little formal interest in regulating activities such as PGD um, for any purpose, really. Um, uh, it may be regulated by the social conscious of individual physicians or groups. But uh, I am concerned about uh, disparities in access to these technologies. And that's why I asked uh, earlier the question I did about sickle cell disease and cystic fibrosis, uh, diseases which are of approximately equal uh, frequency in these populations, actually more common in African Americans, um, but for which uh, there are great funding disparities and treatment disparities. And um, now we've heard from Dr. Zhu today there are was a seven or eight to one disparity in the rate of uh, PGD for this condition in New York City, in which there are many uh, African Americans with sickle disease. To what extent does society have an obligation, I'll ask either one of you, to uh, attenuate these disparities and to assure that these kinds of advanced technologies that we may agree are for the betterment of humankind are distributed uh, equally as social goods? Um, so I think it's important, one of the things that we haven't talked about yet is cost-benefit ratio. And if you're in a country where actually the, the country funds the PGD, like in, like in England, um, England has a finite amount of money and it, it, it chooses a cutoff line based on its perception of, you know, this particular use of PGD is going to really benefit this child, but we're, we're not going to put money into, you know, straight noses versus... Uh, uh, crooked noses because they because they have a, they have a finite amount of money. Um, in the, this country, I I don't know if anybody knows. I think I don't know what percentage of PGDs are funded individually, as opposed to by insurance. But it's a, a lot lot more as individual funding. Um, so so the question then you're asking is well how do you make sure that people who have serious possibilities of having um, uh, uh, problematic uh, births like sickle cell? How do you make sure that they get the, uh, uh, that they are able to access this technology? And, I mean, now, uh, I well, think I was they- asking, do we have an obligation to make sure that there is an equal distribution of this good? Is it, do we have an obligation as a society, or as the panel here, to make okay. sure that children with sickle disease or their parents have the same access to PGD as children with cystic fibrosis, should the government assure equal access in this regard? Go ahead. Uh, I, I, I mean, the, it sort of begs the question to the extent that PGD is different from any other kind of sort of health service, so to speak. And, and, and you know, and, and, and it might sort of be worthwhile to sort of think about that a, a, a little bit. I mean, here in the United States, and I think wrongly so, um, there are millions upon millions of people with no health insurance, no access to sort of basic care, um, no access to um, uh, uh, certain kinds of very basic levels of care. And now we're talking about a new technology which is really um, unfolding in such a way which has tremendous impact not only on individuals but on communities and I think that's that's mm -hmm. really at the core of your question and that you're going to be creating disparities between communities in terms of um, what will what may ultimately be basic levels of care and which will have a, a great um, and dramatic impact on the quality of life um, for people, particularly with sickle cell versus um, uh, uh, CF and so on. And, and, I would, and I would argue that just as I would say the government has uh, 
an obligation to provide a basic level of health care to the extent that this becomes a basic level a basic level of health care then the ob then the obligation of the government is to do so uh, provide access to this in an equitable in an equitable manner and I, I agree with you and I would go beyond that and say since I've been at the Woodrow Wilson School I meet economists who think about the world in other ways um, and just in economic terms, actually, society, it costs society a lot of money to take care of a child with sickle cell anemia who's, who has a very, very difficult life, as we all know, limited difficult life. It would actually be cheaper to have PGD given by society to those people who couldn't afford, who are both carriers of something, some serious disease like, like, like sickle cell. So just purely from a utilitarian economic point of view, it makes sense that that kind of technology should be available for that purpose to everyone. Now, when it comes to straightening noses, that's where, you know, there's no reason the government has to support that. That's a completely different, the but, government shouldn't support that. But of course, policy is always concerned with, with sort of how do, you, how do you sort of draw the line? How would you define what is sort of essential enough in terms of health care or in terms of the well-being of a child or an adult that you would want either government support and intervention or that we as a society would all agree as a, as a matter of um, social interest and culture and economic interest that we, that we want to be in that space. I mean, sickle cell is easy, um, noses are sort of easy, but then as you sort of move a little bit towards the center, it gets a little more sort of complicated in terms of sort of issues like um, deafness or um, achondroplasia, which I have, or um, adult onset um, cancers, for example, to give sort of three very different kinds of genetic conditions that sort of reveal themselves at different times and with different effect in some, at some point, somebody, if we're going to have government pay for it, has to make a decision, yes, that, and no, that. And I think that we as a society are really grappling with how we feel about this, that there is, I think, and I'll use the scientific term, ickiness, about, about sort of just letting individuals make their own, m m make decisions in the, in the privacy of their, um, with their doctors, of venture capitalists uh, or, or what have you, making those decisions of how you sort of are, are, are designing babies and making choices. I, I'm not saying that that's necessarily wrong. I'm just saying that we're not comfortable, I think, with those kinds of very private, let all, l l let anything go on. I don't well, know if you I, disagree. I, I, well, I would I'd separate the use of these technologies into what should the government provide for its citizen. And I would be of the opinion, I mean, a basic level of health care is something the government should be providing for its citizens. Other countries that have universal health care, um, you know, they somehow, they come up with a list of, okay, this is, you know, this is the top of the list, and then you go down to the list, and this is the cutoff where the money runs out, and they have conditions that they will... Uh, take care of and other conditions that fall below the line and they seem you know and it's not it's not totally objective there's a lot of subjectivity but right. they do I mean the state of Oregon did that also yes. yeah. um, and so you can imagine with PGD the same kind of thing going on and if you're below the list you say okay government's not going to fund this but I would argue that um, uh, just from a perspective of liberty no the government's not going to fund it but if you care about it enough I would argue that the individual prospective parents should have the right to do it, even if the government doesn't fund it. That, and that's, I think those are two separate questions. Mm -hmm. so, so maybe we should try to turn the direction a little more in, in the direction of cancer. Um, we've heard about many different uh, mutations, um, polymorphisms today, that clearly affect cancer risk. And these will be better quantified over the next five to 10 years. And it's likely that knowledge of this risk will affect prospective management. And we will be able to prevent cancer by understanding the magnitude of risk in certain strata of patients. That's clearly true with BRCA mutations and pretreatment. So then the question is, 
should we be implementing broad population-based screening programs? As a pediatrician, uh, I know that this is done all of the time. Every newborn has a few milliliters of blood collected and a genetic profile is created. It's created at the protein level, not the DNA level, but it's created. And we know within a couple of days whether the patient has methylmalonic aciduria, a phenylketonuria, a thyroid problem, one of a hundred conditions that mass spec can detect. Does it make sense? Would it be moral? Uh, would it be important? Would it be helpful to include in these screen screening profiles the various um, risk uh, mutations we heard about? BRAC1, perhaps? Uh, the ProArg72 uh, uh, change in, in P53, et cetera. Does this make sense? Well, I think that um, we have to look at risk-benefit ratios and what control parents have over children. Take something like PKU, which is a very simple case. So PKU, you can find it, there's no risk you, you, to do the test. You find it in an infant and then you can, you know, you change the child's diet and the child, you know, it has enormous positive effects for the child. So there's no question about something like PKU. Um, with BRCA1, you know, I guess, you know, knowing that, well, I heard that before the age of 25, if you know that you have a BRCA1 mutation, then the, you can do this prophylactic um, surgery. Um, is it necessary to know that at birth? Does that give you any advantage? Um, Only that you have a captive audience. You'll get it then. Mm -hmm. You may not get it. So again, so in the interest of efficiency and comprehensiveness, and therefore the, the best distribution of equity, right, mm -hmm. of resources, one could argue that it is appropriate to screen for an adult onset disease in infancy. I would argue that, you, that you're losing something in, in, in the name of efficiency here that's very important to um, consider and, and um, think about, particularly when you're screening for a condition in which there, there, there may not be a treatment option, um, um, either in the short term or the long term. And so, um, and I think that just to sort of lay out a couple of the is these issues, and we can talk about them um, at greater length, one is in terms of how does that change, how might that change the identity, sort of the self-identity of the child in knowing that they are marked for having some adult onset disease. I would submit that one, that it does change one's perception of, of oneself and that it changed the parenting. It also has an impact on the parenting relationship of knowing that one of your children is going to have some probability of getting cancer at some point, probably um, not likely until adulthood. And that's, that's, I think, a very, very powerful piece of information. Not all information that is knowable should be known. And, and I don't mean that in a paternalistic way of saying, I know better and I'm not gonna share that with you. But there's some information that people um, may choose not to know or they wanna think about and make a decision about later. And then the other two issues that, uh, that, that I just wanna sort of allude to, although they are very important issues, is, is one is the issue of discrimination. We are not at a point yet where, um, as a matter of employment or insurance, where um, sort of this predisposition information is truly private and therefore um, can be assured not to have an impact on one's ability to get a job, one's ability to secure in insurance and so on and so forth. And I guess last I wanna uh, sort of put on, this, the, on the table this notion, the broader notion of privacy. And to what extent you can say, well, geez, the doctor knows, the parent knows, and that's it. And we're not gonna tell anybody else. Well, that may not exactly be true because some other people along the system may ultimately find out. And so to what extent are we concerned about privacy aspects for this very powerful informi information to which there is really no different treatment plan that's offered? So I would like to, I mean, you've raised some very important issues, but um, 
you can imagine developing a policy that would take uh, Dan's, what Dan sees as benefits to an initial test along with uh, uh, trying to overcome some of the problems that you just said, which is that you know, someday soon, there's gonna be, you could do a complete DNA profile, right, on a person, on a baby. The baby's born and the doctor encourages the parents, I don't think they should force the parents, encourages the parents to do a total. Let me just footnote, when a doctor encourages a parent to do certain things, that is not, I just want to note, that's not necessarily passive. In the history of healthcare, doctors have encouraged certain treatments about children born with Down syndrome, and, the, and, the, and mores have changed and so on. So it's not exactly no, neutral. I, 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 I agree. So just But no, a doctor right. could encourage, so the, the idea I would have is a doctor would encourage the parents to have a total DNA profile, and the parents could just leave that sitting there, or especially on, if they wanted to, especially on genes that you can do nothing about, right, until, you know, later on. I mean, they could have a deal with the doctor and say, well, look, you know, uh, if this, uh, there's this particular mutation and, you know, in 10 years there's a cure, then maybe the doctor might want to notify the parents. I mean, it gets very complicated here. But you can imagine a policy which would basically try to satisfy all of these different uh, considerations. I mean, ultimately, I think that I don't have a problem with doctors encouraging parents to, to do something when, when it's generally agreed to be in their best interests. And I think that parents should have the liberty to find out as much information or not as they want, and the information can be kept private. Um, but then you would have the, the medical community saying, okay, we have new information that's potentially beneficial to this child that information can then be given to the parents because they know the DNA analysis. You know, it's not a perfect system. We right. all know that. I, I think that, you know, a couple of things. One is, to the extent you lay out this sort of, in this hypothetical, you begin to decrease your efficiencies in terms of this, of, of going back and forth, of, of checking, and I'll let you know when one of your, your genes sort of pops up in the JAMA about you know some new new treatment. I think th so. You lose some of the efficiency there. I think it's it's very very difficult to ensure privacy, and and so I, I feel uncomfortable assuming privacy will be there. And thirdly, I mean I'm not a scientist, but your DNA sort of stays the same, and so to the extent that you do the genes the the, the sort of gene screen at birth, or to the extent you do it when that child is now 17 or 18 or 19 years old and is able to make those kinds of choices for themselves to allow the individual to, to own and, and, and have the power of authority to make those decisions, I think is much better than having a parent do it in, within the first weeks of, of birth. Again, assuming that there is no sort of, um, th th that there's no um, changes in, in, in how you would treat the child or, 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 or what have you for any of these diseases, you know, right. for and any I of these potential I don't think diseases. You, I don't think you can make that assumption. Also, I don't think the system would work in the United States. We don't have a national health database in this country. It would work better in other countries where there is a national health database. You're not depending upon individual physicians.